Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on using game theory to understand the fundamental mechanisms behind bargaining. So why are we going to be using game theory in this course? Well, the best explanation is to consider the way people normally think about bargaining, how they understand how to gain bargaining leverage over another party. And that traditional method is to use anecdotal evidence. So for example, you might hear someone saying, I asked my boss for a raise and I told him X, Y, and Z. And after we had our conversation, my boss raised my salary by 25%. Or someone, when they're negotiating over a car, might say that they threatened the dealer with W, and the dealer caved, and so the guy got the price that he wanted on the vehicle. These are anecdotes. These are not science. This is not a good method. The problem is exactly the fact that anecdotes are anecdotes. And when you talk about things very loosely like this, it's hard to actually see and know for sure that your causal mechanisms, what's causing one side to cave into bargaining demands, what's giving one side leverage in bargaining, is actually doing what you think it's doing. So for example, if X, Y, and Z were allegedly causing the boss to raise that person's salary by 25%, maybe it was wasn't in fact X, Y, and Z that was doing it. Maybe in fact it was just X. Maybe X caused that raise by itself and Y and Z were irrelevant to the process. Or even worse, maybe X was helping, Z was neutral, and in fact Y was hurting that guy when he asked for the raise. And in fact X was just so strong in comparison to Y that it worked out eventually anyway, despite the fact that he was actually shooting himself in the foot partially by talking about why. Maybe this was all an accident. Maybe X, Y, and Z had nothing to do with the raise, and there was something else that the guy had said or something else that he had did beforehand, which is actually what caused the boss to give him the raise. Maybe this was all an accident. Maybe there's a fourth thing going on that the person regaling you with his anecdote is completely missing on that's driving all of this behavior from his boss. And maybe... Maybe, let's just give this guy some credit, X, Y, and Z actually were effective, but he didn't get the best deal he possibly could have. Maybe he did X, Y, and Z, and X, Y, and Z were all good things, but there was something else that he could have done on top of X, Y, and Z that were good as well, and that would have been good as well. The problem with anecdotes is that you just don't know when you are talking very loosely what is going on, and that's why in this series we're not going to be using anecdotes to figure out what's driving bargaining behaviors. Instead, we're going to be using game theory. We're going to have models that reveal the causal process, models that show how X causes one side to cave in bargaining, or how X gives another side extra bargaining leverage in bargaining. We are going to use models that will reveal this causation very rigorously. And the way we're going to be constructing these models is by using game theory. This is very reasonable. The reason that we're using game theory is that game theory was created precisely for these sorts of purposes. Game theory was created in 1950s to study, to study strategic interdependence. A situation is strategically interdependent when what I do affects your outcomes and what you do affects my outcomes. And so when we're in these sorts of situations, we need to plan for what the other person is doing. We need to act in response to that, and you need to be reacting into how I am acting in the first place. So I need to get into your head. You need to get into my head. I need to get into your head that you're getting into my head, and so forth. These things are very complicated, and game theory gives us a way to be very careful and very rigorous in how we think about these sorts of things. Moreover, it gives us a vacuum to work with. If we're interested in understanding how something like X, where X could be anything, affects bargaining, game theory gives us a very clean way to figure out what's going on. We can build a model with X. We can use game theory to solve that model. We can then build another model without X and use game theory to solve that model. And we can compare the results between those two models and see what's different. And in fact, if you having X is giving you a better outcome in the model with X, then you're probably better off with X than in a world without X. Game theory gives us the vacuum to figure this sort of thing out. Now, in general, we're going to be working with a three-step method and actually applying this game theory stuff. We're going to start off by making assumptions about the world. Oftentimes, these are going to be very simple assumptions, and I'll explain why in a moment. 
After we have created those assumptions, we're going to use some game theoretical logic. So we have our assumptions, which construct us a model, and then we can use game theory to think about how the people in the model should be thinking about the strategic situation. And once we've done that, we'll have the game theory give us a result, which is, in fact, our conclusion. So we're starting with assumptions, we're using math in the form of game theory to work with those assumptions and draw conclusions from those assumptions. This is not a foolproof method, there is a certain weakness, and that weakness is that our logic, our game theoretical logic, is just mapping valid conclusions from assumptions. Game theory is not black magic, it is not giving me power as a game theorist over everyone else in the world who doesn't understand game theory. All it is is acting as an accounting standard for me to make sure that when we're talking about X causing Y, that in fact the assumptions that we make are actually allowing X to cause Y. What this means, though, problematically, is that if our assumptions are stupid, if I construct a model with dumb assumptions that don't make any sense, then we can't expect our conclusions to be any good either. Game theory is not a cure-all here. If I make stupid assumptions, game theory is not going to solve that problem. The conclusions that we draw from stupid assumptions could also be stupid or they could not be stupid. They're logically valid because we're using mathematics to go from point A to point B. But if we're starting with stupid point A, we could very well end up with stupid point B, and there's nothing that game theory can do to solve that. So we need to be very careful in the assumptions that we make because the assumptions are fundamentally driving our our results. As we go forward, we're going to start off with the simplest models possible. We're going to make a lot of restrictive assumptions about the world to make it a little bit easier to analyze, and then from there we're going to relax those assumptions, we're going to craft more realistic bargaining scenarios and more realistic bargaining situations between two parties, and we're going to see what we can do from there. This is Something that scares a lot of people at first when I say we're going to start off with very simple models, models that don't actually look too much like the real world before we actually build up to those more realistic models. But yet this is exactly what we need to do because this is how science works. Science works by starting off with the smallest, easiest questions possible and building from there. We're not going to be starting with the most realistic models of bargaining possible because if we did that, we'd have a very hard time figuring out what's going to happen and what's going to go on. So in this course, we're going to start off very simple, and we're going to build from there. That wraps up this lecture, and in the next lecture, we'll talk about the different sources of bargaining power that we'll be analyzing, and then after that, we'll actually get into solving some of these models. Hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.